So good to see you. Thanks for coming out this morning. My goodness, it's just wonderful to, to see your faces and a welcome. And thank you for joining us online today. This is just precious that we can get together and be together. And last week, our online numbers were really high. And that's awesome. Thanks for joining us. But I have to think part of that was due to the time change. And some of y'all, y'all didn't wake up in time. And they said, hey, whatever, I'm, going, I'm just going to go on TV today. All right. But however you decide to join us, let's just join together. Amen. Worship the Lord and be together every Sunday. So welcome, whether you're here in person or whether you're online. It's just such a delight to, to be together uh, with you. And today, just a special day, we welcome back Diana Tabaranza as worship leader. And man, so good that... She gave back, and, and uh, as you know, she gave birth to a little Mariah not too many months ago, and uh, today Rico is watching Mariah. It's his turn, but I also think he's online doing the chat today, so thank you, Rico. Let's give Rico a big round of applause. He's serving. He's serving, even though he's watching that little baby. Amen. Amen. And Pastor Fi, are you excited about um, Easter coming up? Yeah. Easter online and in person. Somebody said, what's special about Easter this year? And I said, we get to have it. <laughs> I said, you know, I don't care. I don't care what we sing. I don't care what we do. I don't care. I just want to have an Easter service and say, hallelujah, Jesus, for getting up from the grave, right? I mean, that's, that's really, that's all that matters. All that matters, so join us. Also, Good Friday is going to be an online-only experience, and we won't, don't want you to miss that. And uh, that will be um, airing starting at noon on um, Good Friday, and you can watch it anytime you want. But it's going to just set the tone for that great celebration. So today we are here with part three in our series. This is the final message in the, the series today. I'm picking up the pieces and um, it's kind of uh, out of the ne out of book of Nehemiah. And the context is, is that I feel like I'm coming out of captivity. Much like Israel was coming out of captivity. I know they had a lot worse. I'm not trying to, this is not a contest on who's suffering more. But I'm just thinking about, about captivity and how we are coming out of this year of captivity to this pandemic um, where we couldn't travel. There's quarantines. Ah, rehearse it. You know it. You've lived it. The homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're re-entering this uncharted territory. What's it going to look like when we come out? And so there's a lot of broken pieces. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. And, and like Nehemiah, when he went to put the walls together around Jerusalem, you know, it wasn't like picking up part A and looking for part B and sticking it together like it was Legos, okay? It wasn't like that. It was like just finding some rocks and piling them together and making a wall and getting this thing back on track. And that's kind of what I think we're dealing with is that, that we don't know. I was talking to Tim earlier. We don't know what, what it's going to be looking like to go back to work. We gotta, some of you got to pick up the piece. Some of you got to find a job. Some people have to find out what is work going to look like when I go back. I mean, there have been people, and you're probably well aware of this, you know, that there's actually been folks who, who during this pandemic actually moved out of state and they kept their job. Like they're living in Utah or Texas or somewhere right now and they're still working in California. What a gig, man. I mean, you know, you can go out there like, taking your California salary and go live someplace cheaper. Whoa, I hope your boss never finds out. You know what I mean? It's just like, you, you can afford a plane ticket if they ever do an in-person meeting, right? But are you ever going to be able to sit in a conference room again with anybody? I mean, what's that going to look like? So we have to rebuild, we got to put all this stuff together. And then, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, corporations, they're selling off their office property. They're just like, we don't need it anymore. We can, we can have our, our business and we don't have to, to be together. And I'm thinking, well, what, what's that going to do to, to, the, to the workers who lit, worked in the city with them and had the coffee shops and the restaurants and the stores and people were coming by and on their lunch hour or before or after work? And now that's all gone. Are you following me this morning? Do you get it? I mean, there's a lot of debris. There's a lot of things coming up. And 2020, uh, travel was restricted, and now it's opening up. And we're, we're, gonna, we're planning a trip to Israel next year. Uh, a shameless plug right here. February 22nd to March 4th, 2022. See me for details on our upcoming trip. But we're going back. But we don't know what does that look like. I mean, are we just going to be able to just waltz right in, or do you have to have a vaccine? I don't know. 
So we're picking up these pieces. And so we're looking at the book of Nehemiah in this series and drawing the similarities. Nehemiah was bound and determined to pick up the pieces of, of the former walls of Jerusalem, put it together to build walls, but not just to build the walls for protection, but also God was rebuilding his people. He was rebuilding a culture. He was rebuilding a covenant with a group of people that had broken relationship with him. And so real quick, I know a lot of people don't like history, but I've just got to give you a little bit of context. If you remember back in, uh, not that you lived that long ago, but in your history lesson, in 587 B. <laughs> BC. Are you with me this morning? I feel like I'm moving too quick. I need to slow down. But anyway, I don't have the time to do this. So just got to catch up with me. Run real fast. 587 BC, the Babylonians invaded Judah and Jerusalem and took them captivity and destroyed the city and Solomon's temple. And thousands uh, were taken into captivity in Babylon. But around 70 years later, Cyrus was king of Persia defeated the Babylonians, and soon after he began to allow some of the people from, uh, that had formerly lived in um, Israel and Judah and Jerusalem to go back. And so they went back and they rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the temple not to its former glory, but they got it suitable so that they could worship there. And then sometime later after that, around 445 B.C., it was Nehemiah who came by. And he decided he was going to rebuild the walls around the city. Now, what's interesting about that, I remember, mentioned those dates simply because it was 140 years between the time of ca captivity began and before the walls could be rebuilt. And, and sometimes, you know, we forget that, that, that God is, is keeping his promises, but sometimes God is really, in our opinion, our opinion, our opinion, Lord, nothing against you, but it seems like it's slow. You know, it took 140 years before they come back and rebuild these walls. But then as soon as we start saying, oh gosh, God, you're so slow, all of a sudden Nehemiah comes back and they rebuild the walls in 52 days. So we have to, we have to learn the rhythm of God. We've got to learn how God works these rhythms. So in our rebuilding, we've got to learn the rhythms. You know, some people expect we're going to go back and we're going to just establish this new normal. Mm -hmm, maybe. You know, it may be take you a minute, maybe take you another year, maybe two years. Maybe that won't ever be what it used to be. But here's what I think. I think God is moving. And this word came to me about a week or so ago is the word acceleration. Just as it took 140 years before the walls were rebuilt, once that work started, in 52 days the work was finished. Come on, somebody. I believe the word for you in, in this time, and today's message centers around the word perseverance. That as you persevere, don't give up, okay? Don't give up because the word acceleration keeps coming to my mind. That when God is going to move, he is going to go quick. And, and he's going to move and, and, and see, I don't want to get ahead of myself. You just hold on to the word acceleration for right now, all right? So I want to encourage you with this today. First of all, Nehemiah did something great for God. And he wasn't a priest and he wasn't a, a religious leader. He wasn't a politician. He did have a cushy government job. I will give him that, all right? But he wasn't some great uh, revivalist or whatever. And he was not a miracle worker. There are no written miracles, bona fide miracles involved in this book. He's a regular guy who got the burden for a need and offered himself to God. The other thing is the timing of it. Again, I want you to understand that, that that acceleration, the timing, you've got to be ready in God's timing. You've got to develop that rhythm of God's time and get off of your own timetable. Can I get an amen? At least uh, I'll try it. <laughs> I'll think about it. I don't know. Anyway, okay. But let's be honest. Things were not... Uh, things went quickly for Nehemiah, but it didn't mean that there wasn't a lot of difficulty. If you've read this book or you'll read this portion with me today, you'll understand that there was a lot of frustration, there was a lot of fatigue, there was a, a lot of fear, and there was even thoughts of failure. So when I say the word acceleration and God is moving quickly, you know, we kind of think like we're going to catch this wave and we're just going to surf on through this thing and we're going to get to shore. Well, you know what? You may fall off the board a few times in the process. And you might get afraid of the wave. And there might be some, oh, I'm tired of swimming out trying to catch the wave. 
But you've got to persevere if you're going to see this thing through and you're going to get what God has for you. So I want to start with Galatians 6, 9 this morning. It says, let us not become weary in well-doing, for in due time, say due time. In due time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. So this morning, if you don't get anything else out of this message, if you forget all the dates that I've mentioned, just remember this. Don't give up. Don't give up. So let me read where we're going this morning out of Nehemiah chapter 4. And uh, we're going to be reading verses 6 through 15. And I'll put them up on the screen for you as we read it. And it'll be on the screen as you are at home. So we rebuilt the wall. Till half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Man, we could just stop on, I don't have time, but we could just stop all their heart. You got to have your heart in this thing. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God. Remember, this is a book of prayer. There's like 14 prayers in this book. We prayed to our God and posted a guard and night and day to meet the threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, wherever you turn, your enemies, they're going to attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall and at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, their spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated, we returned to the wall, each, each of us, to his own work. Don't give up. God's at work. God is at work. And again, that song, so timely, even when I don't see it, he is working. So basically, there were four things that Nehemiah and the people had to face and fight against in order to see the thing that God was accelerating in their lives come to pass. First of all, it was fatigue. If you look at verse 10, it says the strength of the workers were, was giving out. It was hard work trying to pick up and put these pieces together. It'd be hard enough if it was like an Ikea box and you could just look there and you could put part A and part B together. But it wasn't an Ikea, it was a bunch of rubble and they just had to work as hard as they could to try to fit this puzzle, this jigsaw puzzle of a wall back together. They didn't have time to figure it out, they just had time. And you know that when you're in a hurry, sometimes you expend a lot of energy. And not only were they expending energy because the work was hard, but they were tired of being threatened. They were tired of hearing bad news. And I don't know about you, but even in this time of rebuilding and coming out of the pandemic, I don't, what, what I'm hearing now is I don't hear how many cases there are. I'm hearing about, which makes me think that it's really getting pretty good. I mean, the, the, the tears are starting to open up, right? Going from purple to red to orange, you know, it's, that part's opening up. So we're not hearing about that because I think there's some good news. But what we are hearing about now is vaccine shortages, you know, it's like a, the, the news media just can't have, any, can't have anything good happen ever. You know, we can't celebrate the fact that maybe we're getting to what, what they call a, a herd immunity. Don't talk about that. Find something really bad so we can pummel the people day and night, 24-7 news cycles that tell you, oh, I know you had an appointment, but it's been canceled because there's no vaccine. I mean, come on. So they were tired of piling on the bricks and they were tired of being pummeled by the bad news of their enemies. Ten times they're coming to us. You'll never finish this work. And yet they did. And God, even in that environment, was able to accelerate. Come on. Isn't that good? That's so good. God is accelerating no matter what. It says the verse 9, they were being threatened. Their physical safety. 
The physical safety, and that's what the news media is doing to you. Your physical safety is in danger. No vaccines. You better watch out. And even after you get a vaccine, wear your mask and don't go anywhere. Stay 10 feet away from everybody. Stay huddled up in your house and continue to be isolated and depressed. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> you, anyway, you get it. They were tired. All right. <laughs> and they were frustrated. I don't know about you, but when I'm tired, I get frustrated. They were frustrated. When I get tired, I get frustrated. We recently downsized we, about Christmas time, real smart during a holiday, <laughs> decided to downsize a house after living in it for 26 years. Like there isn't enough pressure with, with uh, making Christmas work and then in a pandemic and then you say, let's move. <laughs> and so right after Christmas, you know, we're, we're throwing stuff away. <laughs> we went to the dump and we're throwing stuff away. My boys were with me, cut my boys. And we're throwing good stuff away. And my son said, Dad, you can't. I mean, we're at the dump, and we're literally just throwing stuff into the dump. And my one son said, Dad, I had a football. It was a Wilson football. It was good. There's nothing wrong with a football. And I told my other son, see how far you can throw it. He said, Dad, that football's still good. I said, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Just get rid of it. Get rid of everything. I had to go out and buy a new football. Anyway, <laughs> I did. But I was frustrated, and then I got tired, and then the, the you know it says we can't we can't complete this. And I remember one time I love my wife so much; she's so good. She said I was so frustrated. I said this this isn't going to work. This just isn't going to work. We can't get this done. And I sat down all you know in the mully grubs, and she just looked at me and said, "Really? No." So, <laughs> but we got it done. But the fatigue, <laughs> the fatigue brought on a lot of frustration. And when you get frustrated, what do you want to do? You want to quit. You want to quit. All our enemies, it says in verse 11, all our enemies said, before they know it or see us, they will be, they will be right there among them and they'll kill them and end their work. See, you can be, you, you, you can be uh, afraid. So there's fear that also comes into it. When, when you get tired, fatigue frustrates you. Then the next thing is you get into fear. Where... And how many of you know the acronym of fear? False evidence appearing real. Fear is, fear is it just all of a sudden this facade comes and you begin to believe that. And so it says their enemies came and before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we're going to kill them. And then verse 12, they were constantly told an attack is coming. All right, so you kind of get what they were facing. You get the opposition. So what did Nehemiah do? How did he handle this? How did he, what did he, how did he deal with the people when they're facing all these things in this time of rebuilding and trying to restart? So the first thing he did was he reorganized them. He reorganized them. In, in verse 12, it says, when the enemies said they were going to attack, verse 13 says, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with swords, spears, and bows. During this time of pandemic, the word that we've been saying around here, and I'm sure you have been living it, is the word pivot. So you make a plan, right? You make a plan, but then you got to change it. And sometimes when your plan's not working, you can try to work a plan that's not working and it's going to take you right back into that fatigue and frustration and into fear. And you can think you failed. So sometimes just what he did, you just have to reorganize. You have to make a plan and then change it. Okay, so that's what he did. You make a plan, you change it. Instead of freaking out or giving into fear, Nehemiah, Nehemiah said, let's look for the exposed places, let's look for the gaps, and then I want you to station people by families and I want you to equip them to be able to take care of that so that the work can continue. I love that. So what are the gaps that you have? Where is the gap in your plan? Is it your finances? Is there a gap in your finances? And you've been trying to do work this plan with your finances and you just keep running up a brick wall. You know what? You need, to, you need to take a step back and realize if that plan's not working, pivot and find another way. Ask God. Because maybe God is trying to show you something, but you're just not looking. 
You know, the same way with, with a job. Maybe you're looking for a new job and, and you keep running up against a brick wall. Examine your criteria. Look for the gaps. What are you, what are you trying to do? Where are you trying to go? And maybe, maybe you need to look for something out of state. Maybe you need to look at something in a different field. Maybe it's God trying to say, hey, you know that passion that you've had? You know that dream that you've had? Maybe now is the time that you need to pursue that and watch if that's God's timing for you, he's going to accelerate that and you're going to find yourself much happier in a much better place than if you keep trying to work the old plan that's frustrating you and causing you to feel like a failure. You're not a failure. The other thing that he did was he organized people in families. And when I was looking at that, I said, so what about the family? Yeah, it, it is people in your family, but sometimes you have people that are close to you that are like family. I want you to surround yourself with people that are going to encourage you. I want people that are going to be around you that are going to support you. I want to get you people around you that are going to help you uh, fill that gap. You know, stand and intercede for you. So reorganize. Get yourself some good people around you. They're going to pray for you. They're going to encourage you. The second thing that he did is he had to refocus. So first we had to reorganize, had to pivot. Second thing is he had to refocus. You got to get somewhere that you can get so you can see it from a different perspective. Got to have a different perspective. So you got to refocus. So in verse 14, he says, after I look things over, he, he, he got to a place where he, he had to stop looking at things the way he was seeing them because it was just causing the people and he didn't have any answers for them. He just, he was like, okay, you know, and sometimes you just go nuts because you keep looking at the same problem and your vision actually, it starts to get myopic and you just begin to look and you look and you look and you look and your vision gets narrower and narrower and you see less and you see less and the problems get bigger and, and it just, and nobody's got any creativity. He said, I got I to gotta take, take a break. And so he went to somewhere. I don't know where he went. I don't know what he did. But it says that he got to a spot where he could see things differently. It says, Nehemiah, look things over. The best perspective that we can see even if we can't get physically distant. Although sometimes, that's all it takes. Sometimes, my dad used to tell me, I'd call him up and I'd say, Dad, uh, I've got all these problems, I can't see anything. He said, why don't you just take a drive? Just take a drive, just go somewhere. And you know, I did, I would just go drive. I would just go, I'd go find a high place and I'd be able to look out and something is refreshing about that. Something gets your mind off of what your, your myopic vision is seeing and you begin to get ideas. You begin to see things from a different perspective. He looked things over and he got a different perspective. And I'm going to say, if you can't get physically distant, at least look to the, to the word of God. Look at God's word. You know, my, my help cometh from the hills. No, my help doesn't come from the hills. My help comes from God. You got to lift your vision a little bit higher. Stop looking only at the problem. Look to the word of God. Nehemiah said, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Look to God. Remember what God has done. Remember what God can do. Don't be afraid of them. You remember in, in, in chapter 1, when we first started this a couple weeks ago, in chapter 1, it said we remember that, that God has the greatest position. He is the most power. And he is the one who is a promise keeper. He's saying, remember the Lord. Remember the God from chapter 1, people. The God who is over all. He's a promise keeper. He's on your side. In Jonah 2, 7, it says, When I lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once again to the Lord. Turn your thoughts to the Lord. Remember the Lord. And if you can't think of anything what God's done for you, think about what he's done for somebody else. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Peter, when he was walking on water, when did he have problems? When he took his eyes off Jesus. That's enough about that. And take every thought captive. I don't know what Nehemiah was looking at, but here's what I do know. He stopped staring at the problem and he started looking to God and remembered who God was and what God can do. And what he saw in God overruled his fear of man and his circumstances. Oh my goodness. 
Take that one to the bank. Third, the last thing he did was he resisted the discouragement. Had to resist the discouragement. So you gotta, you've got to reorganize. You've got to refocus. And then you have to resist discouragement. Psalm 119, 25 says this. I am completely discouraged. Revive me in your word. Remember God. Keep on fighting. Fight for your brothers, your sons and daughters, your wives and your homes. Don't give up. If you don't give up, the devil never wins. If you don't give up, the devil never wins. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. Now here, I want you to think about this just conceptually this morning before we conclude. And that is this. I often wonder how many people give up the day before God answered their prayer. I just wonder how often people give up on God, the answer that he had the day before the answer came. Because you know what? When you are waiting and you are patient for the Lord, remembering who he is and what he has done that keeps you centered. But when you give up, you begin to drift. You begin to walk away. You begin to change locations. And when God is going to answer the prayer, he's going to give it to the address of faith, which is where you were standing. But when you gave up, what you did was you began to drift. You began to move. And you began to get into depression and discouragement. And lo and behold, the answer dropped in the place of faith that you left. And you missed it. And the blessing was returned to sender. Oh my goodness. Perseverance. Don't give up. Stay in faith. In chapter 6, Nehemiah's enemies wanted him to come down off the wall. They tried to discourage him. They tried to distract him. They said, hey, come on down off that wall. Nehemiah 6, come on. Verse 3, come on. Sam Bal Tobiah, come on down. We want to talk to you. No, they just wanted to delay the work. They just wanted to stop what God was doing. And so if he would have come down off the wall, he would have drifted from that place of faith with saying, God can do this. I'm going to stay at the task. I'm going to keep rebuilding because God's at work and his work is good. But they want him to drift. And the answer to his prayers would have gone, gone, uh, uh, would have evaporated, would have gone away. So stay in your lane, as they say. The lane of faith. So this morning, Deanna's going to come back. And G's coming back. And there's this song, man, it's so good. And I want you to worship the Lord. I want you to think of what God can do. I want you to remember who God is. He's the one with the great. He sits high above. He has the position. He has the power. He's pouring it out on you. The acceleration is coming. Don't you dare move. Because God is rebuilding. He's rebuilding. He's picking up these pieces. He's going to put this thing together for your good and His glory.
let's, let's stand together and I'm going to ask you to pray with me. I think that song just sums it up. Lord, thank you. You redeem, you restore all that's broken. We offer to you, God, the parts of our lives that are broken and dismantled. And God, we ask you to help us to pivot, to put them back together. We stand in faith today, Lord. We identify the gaps, God, and we want to focus on you. So Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts, our lives. Give us creativity. Give us hope. Give us life. Because that's what you do. We thank you that you care so very much for us. Each and every one of us. And God, I thank you that because you're not, as, as in days of old, you're not doing it just for our benefit. You're doing it for your glory. But Lord, Israel was a nation, and there's a whole bunch of people around us in this nation, God, that suffer the same things that we do same fears and fatigue so God help us help us fill us so that we can be vessels that overflow to be able to be a blessing to other people as well this morning God we stand in faith we remember who you are we thank you for what you can do and we bless you for your faithfulness and the covenant that you've given us through Christ. We bless you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if you're in this room with us, if you'd like prayer after the service, feel free to come on up. We'd be happy to agree with you in prayer. If you're online, there's campus pastors that are there. We'll chat with you and pray with you about anything that is concerning to you as well. But be encouraged. Have a great week and go on out there and watch God as he accelerates the process of rebuilding these walls and putting those pieces back together. God bless you all.